Welcome everybody to episode 83 of Trek in Time, where we're going to be talking about being illogical. That's right, we're talking about Kirishara from episode 9 of season 4 of Enterprise. Welcome to Trek in Time, where if you're a regular listener, you should know what I'm doing. We're watching all of Star Trek in chronological order. That means we're currently watching Enterprise. We're in the year 2004, because we also talk about what's going on in the world at the time of original broadcast. And so far, I've only talked about myself, but I keep using the we. Is that the royal we? <laughs> no, you idiots. It's me and my brother, my brother Matt of Undecided with Matt Farrell. He's the tech guy and guru behind looking at, wow, that didn't come out right at all. <laughs> going to go back to and with me is my brother matt he's the guru and inquisitor behind the youtube channel undecided with matt farrell which takes a look at emerging tech and its impact on our lives so with us looking at trek in chronological order and taking a look at the world at the time of original broadcast we're looking at enterprise and we're looking at the year 2004 and matt how are you doing I'm still thawing out from the cold New England weekend that we've been having. Yes. <laughs> Thankfully, it's warmed up today, but bitter, how about bitter you? cold in the Northeast. And I think sometime today or tomorrow, it's supposed to be up in the 40s or 50s here in New York. So yeah. it's like I knew the weather was coming just because everybody had been talking about it. Yeah. But it was Friday at lunchtime. I sat down to eat a sandwich sat down, delicious looking sandwich. And I'm like, I'm going to enjoy my sandwich. By the time I finished the sandwich, I had a migraine that was going through my left eye <laughs> that hadn't existed when I sat down. So yeah, in about 20 minutes, I went from mm, sandwich to somebody drive over me with a truck, please, because I can't oh, take this anymore. And it was all because of the tremendous shift in the weather. The temperature while I was eating lunch apparently dropped something like 15 to 20 degrees. So definitely was related to that. But enough about the weather, Matt. Can't mm. talk about the weather this entire podcast. No. We have to talk about Kirshara Enterprise, Season 4, Episode 9, Season 4. Let that sink in. Season enough. 4. And why We're do I say done. let that sink in? Because this done. is the moment when suddenly the show feels like, oh, this is just full-blown Star Trek. Yes. We've had varying levels of Trekishness over the three previous seasons. There have been moments where we're like, this is where they found their footing. And yes, they did find their footing earlier than this. But I feel like these three episodes, and by the time we get to this one in particular, it's just, oh, this is Star Trek. Did you feel that way about this one as well? Yeah. When, when they got into the expanse, you know, it was like, oh, the show found its footing. It's fun. Yeah. Now it feels like it's found its Star Trek footing because it does feel super Star Trek. Yeah. You know, debates about ethical questions and dilemmas and then a little action mixed in. It, it feels very Star Trek to me too. And having a full-blown return to Vulcan, having the classic Vulcan weapon make its reprise, little elements like that, just put it into terrain that feels like it was largely missing. Yeah. Before we get into talking about the current episode, Matt, did you have any comments from the previous ones that you wanted to share? Yes. There were a couple I wanted to bring up. Uh, one from regular commenter, Palego69. Uh, he wrote, greetings from the laundromat. I made sure to plan laundry for today so I could watch the episode and podcast while sitting here. Priorities, right? <laughs> Smart use of your like, time. Yes. Perfect use of our podcast. While you're doing laundry and folding those socks, enjoy a little Star Trek. Uh, the other comment was from AJ Chan, another regular commenter. Speaking of the animated series, I hope you plan to go through those episodes after you review the original series. I've watched a few episodes, but would enjoy watching the series more if it's alongside your weekly trek in time. And you and I have not really completely talked about or nailed on exactly what we're going to do with this. We have, I have thoughts. We have but thoughts. It's like, we have yeah. talked about this. I know yeah. where I stand on this. I am I know fully I on board with watching these and incorporating them, even as individual I, episodes. I'm like fully on yeah. board with that. So... I'm, it's I'm really on board up to with Matt. not, so yeah, listeners, I'm, I'm not if board. you, <laughs> if you want to sway board. this podcast in that direction, <laughs> send your correspondence no. to Matt. Like it is no. absolutely no, no. up to him because I am like, yes, we should do this because some of them are not only just full blown, really good Trek stories, 
Uh-huh. Some of them do things that no other Trek had done before or after. So there's some stuff in there in the animated shows that are really, yeah. really compelling. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to do it as a standalone. I want to do it like I could see maybe we're doing it alongside the original series. Like we talk about an episode a week of the original series and then we tack on a little animated like talk about it afterwards. I'm not on board with this as standalone. So we'll have to see. Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, listeners, jump into the comments. Do you think that we should incorporate them as I suggested? That would be, you know, vote A for incorporating them as standalone episodes where we would talk about them the way we talk about all the episodes of Star Trek. Should we do what Matt suggested? That would be B, where it becomes incorporated as a like wagon to a talk mm-hmm. about the original series, which I don't like that idea. So we'll just let that sit. Or column C, should I do things on my own and just record standalone episodes that might be released <laughs> in this channel? Just me talking about yeah. them just because I love those so much. So let us know in the comments, jump in and weigh in on that. But enough of that. Cause you can hear the sound in the background. That's the read alert, which can mean only one thing. It's time for Matt to read the Wikipedia description. And of course we've mentioned this before, Matt, you don't have to struggle as much as you used to. We've reached the point where there's actually enough, I think, viewer interest in the episodes to drive people to Wikipedia to revise the descriptions in ways that actually make sense. So Mm -hmm. please enjoy this description (laughs) as you read it. I feel like I should get out some brandy, get on my, uh, (laughs) yes, sit in a leather back chair in front of a fire. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Oh, hi. I didn't see you there. (laughs) Set in the 22nd century, the series follows the adventures of the first Starfleet starship Enterprise. Registration NX-01. In this episode, Enterprise attempts to overt a war and is caught in the crossfire between Vulcan and Andorian starships. Literally. Meanwhile, Captain Archer, Commander T'Pol, and T'Pau aim to take the Kashara to the Vulcan capital and use it to reveal Ambassador Velas's plot to the rest of the Vulcan High Command. And I almost got ton- a little clunky tied on at the end there. Yeah, he's not <laughs> yeah. in. Ba- he's he's administrator, but administrator. Yeah, yes, that was not a fault of Wikipedia. Six of that one. was just Matt not knowing how to read. No. So this is episode number nine of season four. It's directed by David Livingston. This is his second of the season, but definitely not his first ever. He's been a recurring name in the director's seat. Written by Michael Sussman, again a regular contributor as a writer. This is his third of the season. And the original air date of this was December 3rd, 2004. Guest appearances include Robert Foxworth as Administer Veloz, again. Jeffrey Combs, again, his sixth appearance as Commander Shran. John Rubenstein as Minister Kuvak. Gary Graham, again, a regular of the series as Ambassador Saval. Michael Riley Burke as Koss. Kara Zydeker as T'Pau. Todd Stashwick as Talak. And Jack Donner as the Vulcan Priest. And I wanted to call out Jack Donner in particular. Jack Donner appeared in the original series. He was in the Enterprise incident as the Romulan commander, Mm -hmm. sub-commander Tal. And I actually found a photograph of him, which we may include in the video on YouTube. And I just thought it was a really great little tip of the hat to him to bring him back in this role. And what was the world like when this originally aired on December 3rd, 2004? Well, Matt, I have been making the same joke over and over for weeks now. (laughs) Whenever we get to what did you listen to over and over at this time of year in 2004? And the reason I'm making this joke over and over is because over and over, we find out that the song that was the number one song (laughs) in the country was over and over by Nelly (laughs) featuring Tim McGraw. As I've mentioned before, I've said it over and over. We will be hearing this over and over about over and over for the rest of 2004. And at the movies, (laughs) it's no longer a horse. Uh, I'm just going to keep beating the ground. I've made a divot and I'm just going to keep going at the movies for the second week. National treasure, the 2004 action adventure film featuring Nicolas Cage was the number one movie. 
it added another 32 million on its way to earning eventually 347 million. And on television, well, once again, we're looking at enterprise trying to make a dent on the Friday night lineup. What does that mean? They're up against on ABC, eight simple rules and complete savages. Those shows were getting roughly 6 million viewers each on CBS. Frosty the Snowman, the animated oh holiday film, getting 10 million viewers. And Frosty Returns, the highly anticipated sequel in which we find out, <laughs> can a snowman survive the coming of spring? Also got 10 million viewers. That 70s show and Quintuplets. Mm, Quintuplets. Remember that show, Matt? Oh, yes. absolutely. Yeah. I know you were a huge fan right of that on Fox. They yep. received 3 million viewers each and that's in repeat. So here we have eight simple rules, complete savages getting 6 million frosty, the snowman, a short animated show and its sequel that were produced, I believe in the 1960s getting 10 million. Yeah. That 70s show and quintuplets in repeat getting 3 million dateline NBC featuring an interview with Leonardo DiCaprio, an actor who, whatever happened to him, getting 8 million viewers. And then on the WB, what I like about you and Grounded for Life, both getting about 2 million. So Enterprise was able to beat the WB with this episode. It earned 3 million viewers. And here's the thing that's kind of the sad trombone moment of this. This would be a season high for Enterprise. So does it come as any surprise that this would be the final season? For this show. And in the news, some highlights from the headlines around this time on December 3rd, 2004. Dragomir Milosevic, the general who besieged Sarajevo for three years during the Bosnian Civil War, surrendered to the United Nations International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. 12,000 people died during the siege, and he would eventually go on to be convicted and sentenced to 33 years for multiple counts of murder, terror, and inhumane acts. Also in the news, CBS and NBC refused to air an advertisement by the United Church of Christ, citing the advocacy of accepting homosexuals as too controversial. I did a double take as I read that as a headline. Yeah, that's surprising. I forgot about that. And there was also this about the People's Republic of China. They launched a new long range nuclear submarine and an accompanying class of ballistic missiles with a range in excess of 7,400 kilometers developed by the People's Liberation Army. And the reason this caught my eye was not because of the news itself, but because of its strange relation to current events. Just yesterday, yeah. as we're recording yeah. this, the United States used a Sidewinder missile launched from an airplane to shoot down a spy satellite or a spy balloon from China. Sp spy balloon. Yeah. And China has continued to argue that it was scientific research done by private individuals. However, this is the fourth time since 2016 that this has happened. So on to today's episode, we find ourselves with everything left hanging at the end of the previous episode. The Enterprise is on yep. its way to Endoria. Archer and T'Pol are stuck in the Vulcan desert with Tapau, trying to figure out how to get the Kishara back to a place where it'll do the most good. And Matt, which of these two major plot lines do you want to visit first? Let's do the Kishara stuff, uh, the captain. Okay. So my first question to you is what aspects of this stood out to you as being the biggest leap forward for the show? Because there's a lot here that feels very much like Star Trek. And there are some elements that feel a little samey from basically any action show. So you get moments where like, oh, people are running and people are you know, fighting one another. And there's those aspects. But sometimes there are things within those that strike us as being like, oh, okay, this is an appropriate thing for this show to be pushing forward now. And I'm wondering what elements of this part struck you as being like the biggest gold nuggets to hold on to? Uh, well, one thing I would say is the whole white savior, human savior of Vulcan aspect that we kind of ridiculed a little bit last time. It's even more here in this one for me, yeah. but putting that to the side, what I really, really liked about this storyline was the, the delving into the Vulcan history 
that Star Trek lore that really scratched the itch for me around how the Vulcans were finding their way back towards what we know of Vulcans from the original series and beyond and how the texts that's in the Kashara that we discover by the end is what is the key and seeing the whole thing, kind of the debate between T'Pol and the captain as to whether he's still, whether he actually is experiencing the memories or the soul of the Vulcan that's inside him or not, that aspect of it, I really enjoyed the debate between the two of them a lot. I enjoyed how the captain is now fully embracing what's happening to him. He's not, he doesn't seem to be like the last episode, he was kind of grappling with what is kind of happening to me. Like there were moments where he was looking kind of befuddled and this one that was all gone. He's just full on. I got this dude in me. I know stuff. Let's go. Just, he was just in full on embracing what was happening and totally was into it. And the whole thing, like he's doing the Vulcan neck pinch, I thought was a nice little, little touch because it was, and even um, uh, was it Tapao even commented at one point of your technique is getting better. It's like yeah. when he took somebody down, it was like little elements like that showing how this is affecting him and making him more Vulcan like in his approach to things was a lot of fun. But I just really enjoyed the for me the gold nugget was seeing what is meant to be a pivotal moment in Vulcan history kind of unplaying in front of our eyes, which is what yeah. I expect out of Star Trek. I expect some you know, this is going to have some kind of a profound effect. It's kind of like the next generation, the whole Borg stuff with the captain getting, you know, captured. It's like, it's a pivotal moment. We're watching the pivotal moments of Star Trek history. And that's what makes the Star Trek shows Star Trek to me. And here's a yeah. pivotal moment in Star Trek history that we're watching. And so that's kind of why I liked that storyline of them setting aside the fact that the captain had to be the person that's the one saving Vulcan. Which yeah. I still don't like but I did like what they were exploring and the conversations around that. I agree with you. When you boil down a lot of the original series, it really does come down to the enterprise meets a group of people they haven't ever interacted with before. And something changes yeah. the course of either the members of the crew or the people on the planet. Like, yep, It's that pivot point that you're talking about. And that's dramatic storytelling. That's why we tell stories. Mm-hmm. If you tell a story, about you go to the store and you bought some groceries and you brought them home. What's, what's the point of that story? But if you go to the grocery store and you meet the love of your life, that's a story. So Mm -hmm. I think that that's on display here and in the discussion around what does it mean to be Vulcan? Archer has some really great comments where he's laughingly talking to, to Paul about, I never got you guys before. And now I do (laughs) like, I get it now, like what you've been pursuing, the centeredness, like it's almost like he's gone on an accidental spiritual retreat and he even ends with, maybe I'll pick up meditation. And she says it would probably be beneficial for you. (laughs) It's this sort of accidental convert. And she doesn't even know how to interpret this side of the captain saying, I understand and appreciate you in a way that I didn't before. And this is after they already have a very good relationship at this point. At this point, there's no question. She is, has totally made herself devoted to support of him. The fact that she has joined Starfleet and she says of the Serenites, this radical faction. And he makes the point of saying, you went so far as to join Starfleet, which a lot of Vulcans would consider radical. So yeah, it's a lot of discussion around context, matter of perspective and relationships. There's this great sequence where T'Pau reveals that she had actually mind melded with T'Pol's mother. It's a little reminiscent of Spock and Picard talking about the fact that Spock had never melded with his father and Picard offers him the opportunity to meld with him. Mm -hmm. That is played for a lot more deep emotional impact than this. And I think intentionally. So I think they knew they had an echo going here that they didn't want to try and recreate too much, but it's, it's a nice moment. Nonetheless, it is reflective of to Paul's struggles with her new relationship to being 
first of all, she brings up the mind melding, which she was forced into the Pinar syndrome, which she has struggled with and the emotional changes in her post going into the expanse and the changes she put herself through, through the taking in of that mineral. So here she mm -hmm. is now revealing these things to Paul, to, to Pow, and to Pow surprises her with, I could probably fix the Pinars because that is as much a myth as the mind melding itself. It is it's our birthright. It's our probably. birthright. And the yeah. Pinar syndrome to Pow explains is when somebody who doesn't know what they're doing inadvertently causes damage, but to Pow suggests she could fix it. So I think we have another turning point on a personal level for to Paul who post this experience. And we'll talk about another element of her journey later on, I'm sure. But in this moment, it is potentially another shifting point for her as a Vulcan. And well, there's the I... reflection of Vulcan society in general as the result of the Kishara making a, a giant turn. Now, let me ask you this. One of the things I really liked about this part that you're talking about now is how everything wo weaves together so neatly in what this, this show has been doing from the very beginning. And yeah. I'm not sure if it was intentional or a happy accident because all along the Vulcans have been more emotional than we're used to a little more devious than we've ever seen them. They outright lie, which we've never yeah. seen them do the whole, their sp the outposts where they're spying all that stuff from the very first season to now is like, they've set it up that the Vulcans are not what we know. And in this, they're clearly showing that here's this repressive regime in Vulcan that has basically said mind melding is basically illegal. It's taboo. It's dangerous. Yeah. Um, Serenites are this faction that's been shoved off to the side and this it's very deliberate because we talked about this last time, mind melds, you become one with each other. You can't lie. So yeah. it's like lying becomes impossible in a society where everybody can mind meld. It's so also about first lie, sources. Yeah. You know, so the teachings, right. the teachings would be transmitted directly as opposed to being lost. Right. That, that that's part so, of it too. So, so a regime wouldn't be able to lie to its people. Yeah. So it's kind of like, it makes sense why you would ban mind melding and here they are like, oh no, it's our birthright to do this. And so once they get that back going into the future Star Trek, you can understand why suddenly all of Vulcans are very matter of fact, they don't lie. They're following the, they, you know, they're all kind of following that Serenite mentality. But it makes sense why they're a little more uniform depiction of them as well. Correct. Right. So it's like, I don't know if that was an accident. Like, I don't know if it was like they weren't thinking about this in seasons one through three, but in season four, they were like, hey, I got an idea of how we can make make this sense or if it was the yeah. plan all along to do this. I'm really curious which one it was. If I had to speculate, I think that they at the very beginning had one foot pointed in that direction, but hadn't thought it through right. completely. I have a feeling that yeah. Manny Cotto came in as showrunner at this point and really kind of like, we need to build a bridge. If this show is going to continue, we need to build a bridge to the original series because we have inconsistencies yeah. here now with the fan base. I don't know that anybody would have had when Saval is first introduced, he's very much the antagonist. He's a representation yes. of a government that is not looking at what earth is doing as a good path. By the end of this episode, He's basically like, we're going to step back from trying to control you guys. And we're going to get in line behind you because you guys seem to be focused in a way that has such positive results. So it's the yeah. Vulcan administration at the end of this episode, they're like, we're dissolving this high council. We're going to back away from earth. And I think you're seeing a new dawn of what it means to be in this neighborhood of systems and yeah. We, of course, as fans know, okay, we know what's coming, but in that moment, it is a huge change for Saval and Saval goes through in this three story arc. If you only came to this series for these three episodes, if you hadn't watched anything else, you would still have a sense of Saval's story arc of yeah. starting off with this semi antagonistic relationship, beautifully depicted in the scene with Forrester where Forrester says, wait, are you scared of us? And there's that nice discussion around what humans look like to a Vulcan. 
-hmm. and then through this with the torture sequence with shran and oh yeah the, the evolution of saval's position in helping undo this regime including his revealing of i can do things that have been forbidden and i'm not a serenite but i know what they are talking about and it's not that he wants to disprove them he's just there are things that we don't know as opposed to Vlas, the main administrator who is fully going full-blown dictator and it's all about control and you see him using vulcan attitude about arguing from a logical perspective for terrible acts and of course mm -hmm. this is in 2004 this is following the U.S. invasion of Iraq, where all sorts of evidence and arguments around our ethical and moral obligation to go into Iraq. At this point, all of that crap had hit the fan and everybody knew, OK, this was a boondoggle to begin with. And now we're in this terrible quagmire and not to argue at all that Iraqis would have been better under Saddam Hussein, but our first principles in going in were fabricated. And here we have a storyline in popular media in Star Trek of all places, basically saying here is a major race that you've been familiar with through all these stories. This is what they did as well. And it's all to create a scenario to go to war in the name of it's logical for us to strike first in order to undermine what we think is an unstable regime, even fabricating, holding onto the Zindi weapon. It's a remarkable storyline given what we know of the yeah. Vulcans as characters in the future of Star Trek. But I would, I would actually say, I agree with you hundred percent on that, but there's a, for me of like, there's kind of, I'm looking at it three parts. There's the Kashara with the captain, that whole part there's on the enterprise with Saval and trip and crew and then there's what's happening in the high like the council and for me the weakest element is the council and it all comes down to that chewing the scenery performance by the guy that's playing Vlas. yeah i don't blame him for that i he believe it's i believe that. that all rests with the directors yeah yeah it's robert but foxworth it's so, he's a good character actor he's been in lots yeah, and lots right. of things and yes he is just he's allowed to twirl mustaches left and right here it is unfortunate. Like, it is, it, it's, it undercuts everything. Cause like what you're saying is hundred percent true of like, it's, it's modeling after what happened at the time, 2004, it's making a clear statement about that, but because he's so much mustache twirling and he's so, he is like amped up to 11 emotionally. He's like, a yeah. he's, he is full on Romulan. You know what I mean? He is just completely unhinged and nobody is calling him out on it. The yeah. only person in the council that's calling him out is not calling him out for, dude, why are you so emotional? He's calling him out because like, I don't think this is right. You know, like, yeah, where did you, where do you get that evidence? He's being that's very John logical Rubenstein about like, as where, Minister Kuvak, who's trying to be the voice right. of reason. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's, it's great that he's there as the voice of reason. Somebody that's dissenting and pushing back. It was great to have that to show that the council is not unified behind this man. But at the same time, it's kind of like, He's not acting like a Vulcan in the slightest. Yeah. And it's like, and nobody's looking uncomfortable. It could have been him being the only voice. But there should have been moments where when Veloc is yelling or getting really worked up, just showing those guys in the background, kind of giving each other side eye, like what is going on? Yeah. Like the, showing them recognizing he's There were off. two paths. Yeah, I agree with you completely. There were two paths here for the directing. And I think that, I think that at this point, I don't even put, the blame on David Livingston as director, because we've seen him so many times. We know he's very good. Yeah. I think the network at this point was probably stepping in and saying it's Friday night. We got to get kids. If anybody's going to watch this show, you got to get kids, which means you have to kind of water down subtlety. You've got to make things a little more black and white. You've got to have your villains look like villains and your heroes have to be heroes. So I have a feeling at this point that Livingston <clears throat> hands were tied to a certain degree. One path would have been going the direction you're describing, which I think would have been a great path to have him continue to chew the scenery. He can be that cartoonish looking villain yep. and have all the other Vulcans in the room giving each other looks like, are we really seeing what we're seeing here? 
The other yeah. path would have been to pull back, which as a more mature viewer, I would have enjoyed more, which is go full subtlety, have him come across as yeah. coldly logical and have the other Vulcan maybe demonstrate a little bit more emotional response in the form of like, really? Like we're doing this because I like Rubenstein's performance. I don't like Veloz's. So I think yep. if, if Veloz came across as super cold and calculating, it might've been more chilling because then you have everybody in the room kind of, well, he's not demonstrating something that we don't understand. So yes, let's right. continue to support him. And the argument is made that it's the Kishara, which is going to be the revelation for everybody. And this, this brings us now to the, the other storyline, which is the, on the yep. desert sands, the archer leading to Paul and to pow back to bring the Kishara, which is going to change everybody's minds. I found this to be a weaker storyline for me. You mentioned that you thought that the, the high command sequences were the weakest for me. This mm -hmm. was the weaker because I didn't mind the action. I didn't mind the fact that you see the, the Vulcan guards show up and they're carrying that Vulcan weapon, you know, so they can do hand to hand combat clearly showing up with phase weapons would have made more sense logically, but it wouldn't have looked quite as Vulcan. So here we are. They missed an opportunity. I enjoyed to play the, the right action sequences. I the enjoyed fighting. the what with the with the fighting sequences. They missed the chance of doing the na 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 na. I wish they had an updated version of that song. And the yes. there was a sequence where it's it's a you know the reference to Chekhov's gun. If you see a gun appear on stage in the first act, it's got to go off by the third. When they're walking through these passages, and Tapao says, "Look out." there's a mineral in there and watch what happens when metal yep. gets too close to it. And then later on, of course, we see a couple of Vulcans walk into a passage with metal weapons and they get zapped. So all of that was fine. I've been like, okay, it's action adventure. It's fine. It's fun. Yep. But for me, the difficulties were around motivation. They kept saying, let's get the Kishara to the capital. And I'm like, you find an original version of the Bible, let's say, you don't say quick, get me to Rome. Like it just didn't jive in a way that, that I didn't understand that they had a clear idea of what they were going to do. And Archer never revealed, Oh, I know how to activate this. He could have activated it at any moment. They were in the desert. He could have pressed those buttons and he, they could have seen the scriptures and been like, okay, this is yep. why. But I felt like they were withholding from the audience a little too much of like, wait, why are you going to the capital of all places? The most secure location, but like, so it's a little bit hand wavy as far as like, here's why we're going there. I also didn't like yeah. archers. It would have helped if when archer is like, I know logically going after to Paul and rescuing her doesn't make sense, but I'm human. So I'm going to do that. I don't think that they hammered that hard enough that he was making a human decision as opposed to a Vulcan decision. Mm -hmm. But even having said that, I don't think the human in him would have made that decision. So it was a moment where I was no. just like, okay, wouldn't he understand? Like, it's more important that we get this thing to where we're going. So I found myself yeah. thinking they're not sharing with us why getting it there makes sense. They're also now not sharing why going after DePaul makes sense. It all felt very worthy action storyline as opposed to, well, that's yeah. Yeah. Being, I, I being a part of I, the intellectual thrust of the episode. I, I think that's why when I was talking about that, that storyline is one I kind of enjoyed. I was just hand waving, just ignoring that part. Cause all that action stuff was just like, it washed over me. It was like, most of this doesn't make sense. It doesn't really matter. They just have to get it to the capital, whatever. But it was the stuff that happened kind of before that. And during yeah. that, where they were talking about the history and the, his attitudes sh shifting those conversations, yeah. I thought were really kind of the golden nuggets, but I agree with you. It's like, th it was a weak, weak part of the story. And it was yeah. clearly that just there for we need some uh, fist to fist, hand to hand action here. So let's just yeah. have people just fight in the desert. That that does bring us to, unless there's something more you want to say. No, I was going to say that. probably what you're going to say, which is that brings us to what's going on in space. The Enterprise. Yeah. Yes. I, I got to say, this is another part of the story I absolutely loved. Again, I love seeing how at home Trip feels as commander. It was so cool to see. Once again, he's just... Yeah super ease commanding the enterprise. It doesn't feel like he's not no longer fish out of water. 
He's making decisive decisions. And some of the shortcomings we talked about in the last episode were actually talked about in this episode, whether they actually had this debate about like, are you doing the right thing? Like Reed yeah. and Trip have this excellent conversation where Reed's like, you were ordered to come back to earth yes. and you're not. And I like and the fact Trip's that like, Reed is in that in You that can come moment, to my court martial. And I like the yeah. fact that Reed in that moment is effectively being a good first officer, challenging the captain's yes. decision-making yes. and saying like, okay, you, you're doing these things, but here's the argument against it. And the back and forth between the two of them is straddling that line of, officer relationships and friendship. And I yep. think the writing does a really great job of revealing like really this good. is a legitimate debate between officers, but it's in the language of friends. The fact that Trip ends it with like, you can get a seat at my court martial. Like that's not what Picard would say to Riker. Picard and Riker having the same conversation would have been very official sounding. It would have been very different. Yeah. And it would have yet again been a very common conversation from the original series between Kirk and Spock, but it wouldn't have sounded like this. So it's, I think the writing was very strong for this, this part of it. There's also, it's a vault. Saval is it's terrific Saval, in this story. When line. he comes into the room, when he comes to the room immediately after Reed leaves, and then the, he has a conversation with Trip, and Trip's like, I'm not sure I'm doing the right thing. And Saval says, for what it's worth, I think the captain would be doing the exact same thing you're doing. Yeah. And then Tripp saying, that's what I keep telling myself. Yeah. It's like, it, I just like the fact that we're showing doubt in a private scenario, not in front of the crew on the bridge. It was just, it felt very like, like you said, Picard talking to number one in his ready room. It felt yeah. very, you go trip. I can see you at some point becoming a captain yourself. It's like, yeah. he felt very at home. Like it's nice to see him grown up from season one to now. And then the writing was just really strong with all these conversations that were happening. Yeah. I don't know if you want to, I was going to jump to when they go and search for the Andorians. I, I really enjoyed the Saval saying, I know where to find the yeah. Andorians. We know we're hiding. They, we know great episode for Gary Graham and Saval. It's, it's yeah. a great episode for him because yeah. he's able to really like, I mean, Gary Graham must have been patiently, happily, you know, doing the work that he was given during the previous three seasons. But for yeah. these episodes in particular, he must have been very happy to have been in this position to be given this kind of scene yeah. time because he's really depicting a Saval who the first time we see Saval back in episode one, he's just the Vulcan who's like, you guys aren't ready. You're losers and yeah. wants to shut the door on Earth. Here he is now giving a very compelling and nuanced performance around, yeah, we know what the Dorians are up to, we understand where they've been hiding. He's got all these, these moments where he's able to reveal Saval knows what he's doing. Saval is a smart yes. guy and he's been able to yeah. rise to a high level under what is effectively a despotic regime. And he's been doing it in the name of protecting Vulcan. So he's been a cog in a bad machine, but for good reasons. And I like that complexity for this character. Also, when they finally do get to the nebula and Saval tells them to basically radio into the cloud and he keeps calling out like, I know you're here. Yeah. We know you're here. Please answer me. We have important information to you. There's nothing. There's nothing that I'm saying. And Tripp's like, uh, hey, uh, this is Trip. Uh, what's yeah. up? <laughs> and then he finally responds. Yeah. I just love the fact that that the, the endurance are just ignoring the Vulcans because they don't trust the Vulcans. And then here comes a pink skin they know. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, Trip. I know you. Yeah, I yeah. trust you. Yeah, Trip I really enjoyed gets the call that out that happened. Yeah, really, yeah. really funny moment yeah. and not played for laughs. That what that's what made it work. No, it was so subtle yeah. because Trip says, hey, this is Trip in command of the Enterprise. And then immediately dink, they get the response. It's almost like yeah. Tran is yeah. there like, is that is yeah. it is OK. <laughs> yeah. So that leads us to there's the back and forth initially around can we believe you? I like the scene very much between the first scene with Shran coming aboard and like, why would you do all this? Mm -hmm. Why would you share all this? And Saval making all of his very logical arguments and statements, but it's just not enough for Shran. There is not enough of a foundation of trust, even though they do, they, they do refer to the fact that they've had months long negotiations previously. It's just not enough, which leads Shran to abduct and then torture Saval. What did you think about the whole torture sequence? Okay, so I liked it, 
but <laughs> Shran's re reaction, he's clearly torn because they make the comments of like, there's clearly a real, uh, I wouldn't call it a friendship, but a respect that has grown between the two of them. So Shran doesn't want to be doing what he's doing. I think they could amp that up a little bit more because there were moments where it was kind of like he went too easily into the torture. They did try to play it off as like, especially in the beginning of the torture scene where Shran, what was it? The, the Saval says, let's just get this over with. And Shran's like, yeah, good point. Let's just go. Let's just amp this up really fast. Let's fast forward yeah. this as fast as we can because we got to do what we got to do. I thought that was kind of a nice touch, but I also want to kind of call out. I absolutely love how the how Saval says torture doesn't work. Pain doesn't work on Vulcans. And then this like diabolical torture device the Andorians have come up with of like, oh no, we're not going to hurt you. We're yeah. just going to make you feel emotions in a way that's going to be really uncomfortable for you. Yeah. It's like, we're going to unvulcanize you. Yeah. Yeah. And it was like, and the look on Saval's face of like, oh shit. And just yeah. like that, that, that look that comes over him when he realizes what's about to happen. I, it, it was a nice playful kind of like, not playful, but like it was fun to see how the Andorians are sparring with the Vulcans and neither one of, they both are just like at each other's throats for no really good reason, but it's interesting to see how they're kind of like finding each other's weaknesses and trying to play on those weaknesses. Yeah. But for me, I think they could have amped up the reluctance of Shran wanting to do this. Yeah. And it was a little too subtle for me. So it's, there were moments where it was kind of like, uh, Shran, you, you just seemed a little too glib about just like, <laughs> let's amp it up. Yeah. They could have shown like maybe his crew being fine, cranking it up and then cut to him kind of like, like Darth Vader, you know, standing, watching his son get tortured by the emperor like, kind of like looking back and forth of like, I don't like how this is playing out. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's like, they could I have think played that, that up. Yeah, I agree with you. And I, I think that there could have been something, I think what you're looking for is an opportunity for Shran to have that personal relationship in that it's sort of like the trip read conversation. You're looking for an opportunity for Shran to have that personal relationship on display as much as the professional relationship of adversaries on opposite sides of a very tense standoff. And the way this is written and depicted, there is no room for that personal. It is all adversarial professional relationship. I think it would have been aided by what I kept going back to would be what if there had been a scene immediately previous to this where Shran is reporting alongside a lieutenant with his commanding officer through, you know, an on, you know, on screen conversation saying, and that's what the Vulcans have. That's what Saval has laid out as the Vulcan plan and have this superior say, I don't believe him. I don't trust your judgment in this scenario because too many times you've been out there by yourself calling these shots on your own. I don't like the decision making you've been making. So I'm going to give you one more shot. Takes of all and get yep. the truth out of him and then say directly to the lieutenant. And if Shran doesn't do this, you have my permission to take command of the ship. Put Shran in a position where he has no choice. So he goes and does all of this and is basically torturing Saval with that reluctance, sharing that reluctance with Saval, but also doing it with yep. an eye toward his lieutenant saying, I trust this guy. Can you please join me in trusting this guy? Have that yes. tension come from a, a force behind Shran. Exactly. And what you that's, get that's what there, was missing. It's, yeah. And what yeah. you get if you do that is you also then create that mirror image between Andoria and Vulcan. Vulcan is Saval yes. is the reasonable yes. element coming forward and saying, look, I want peace. I want to save my people as much as you want to save yours. And behind me is this despotic ruler. And if Shran is coming forward and saying, look, I know I can trust you. Behind me is a different despotic ruler. You could end up with that mirroring of the two sides. What you end up with here is Shran doing something that is kind of out of character a little bit. Yeah. There's a moment of him saying, I wish I didn't have to do this. I wish I didn't have to do this. And it made, for me, it made those torture sequences feel too long. I would have appreciated mm -hmm. less of the torture sequence and a little bit more of what I've just described of him in a position of my lieutenant has been told to keep an eye on me. And I know that. So I have to do this performative thing for him because this guy is going to take command of the ship if I don't do this. So right. 
that would have added a layer to it that I think would have really benefited not only the what does happen on screen, but the bigger picture of Andoria is in its own version of an awakening as what Vulcan is mm-hmm. going to be going through as a result of the Kishara. Yeah, agree. So one of the big elements of this is how do you get the Kishara into the capital? They reach the precipice literally they're looking off of a cliff over the the capital city and there's this whole like well we're, we made it this far what do we do now and archer makes the little winking at the camera comment i think i know a guy and yeah. it turns out that it is to paul's husband who helps them because of reasons found mm-hmm. it very strange that he did this? I mean, like, did that stand out to you as like, wow, that really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It didn't make sense. It felt a little too convenient. Uh, Like, especially when he was like, I wouldn't be a good husband if I didn't help my wife. And by the way, you're not my wife anymore. Go enjoy your life. And he walks away. It was like, well, that was awfully convenient. A yada, yada, yada. They get exactly what they need and all the characters can go on their way. Maybe Trip will get back together with, you know, to Paul. It was like, it was all way too convenient. Yeah. So I, but minor nitpick minor nitpick it stands out as being <laughs> yeah. a very strange set of yeah. circumstances to put on screen i yeah. you know like found it very odd would have felt less awkward if Tapau had said i know people who can get us into the city like that would have yes like here she is she's the vulcan and yet again it's about archer saying like don't worry i have a plan and gets them into mm-hmm. the capital city where they just again hand wavy enter the Capitol building right into the main chamber with the high council because, well, who could see through a robe (laughs) and really just put that hood up and yeah, you can walk right in. Go ahead. You clearly are a Vulcan. So do whatever you want. Yeah. They get in there and Archer dramatically activates the Kishara. And it is at this point revealed that these ancient writings of Sirach have been saved with in the form of a really dramatic laser light show for some reason. Uh, for the Pink Floyd. Yeah, exactly. It's like, you know, just put on dark side of the moon at the exact moment that they enter the chamber and the two come into sync and you just like mellow out, man. But <laughs> you go, <laughs> yeah, the, <laughs> the whole sequence <laughs> is fine. I mean, it's like, it's, yeah. It's interesting to look at. It doesn't make any sense logically. Like, like, like I've got these writings and I know these are important to save. So I'm going to save them in this three dimensional circular hologram that will just continue to evolve as you're looking it's, at it. Like it's like, for TV. All oh, right. It's for TV. I get it. Like hand wavy. <laughs> yeah. But <ba-da-ba-da-ba. laughs> and it's like, they, they've got these things now and it is such a dramatic reveal that again, for reasons, the high council is like, aha, we need to ignore Velas, oust him, dissolve the council Mm -hmm. and like start over, hit a reset button. Literally the last three minutes of this feels like it could have been weeks worth of episodes. Like the Vulcan government effectively deciding like, holy cow, we've been doing all sorts of stuff that doesn't make any sense. And here's what our pinnacle teacher said in his own words there's so much that could have come out of this obviously they weren't making this entire series about that so they weren't going to do that and they have to have this kind of conclusion of like better days are ahead so i understand why they get there but it feels very fast forward like that last three minutes like and like you said when you get to that point where to paul's husband shows up and is like you know what i did it because of you but you know what i really don't want to be married to you either so you know what why don't we go our separate ways it feels a little bit too much of a bow on top and I understood it, but I don't think I needed it. Yes. Well, it was clear, like they probably had a lot they wanted to do and they knew this was their last season and they knew they had to fast forward a bunch of stuff. So that's kind of what it felt like to me. Like let's wrap this up as fast as we can. Cause we still have X, Y, and Z that we need to get to before the end. Right. Is what it felt like to me. And then of course there's the very end of the episode, which is like, Oh, Velas is working with Romulans. Okay. There we go. Yeah. It's like, yeah (laughs) that element received a lot of debate at the time reviewers thought that Mm -hmm. this episode was a return to form for star trek 
but the very, very end split them like 50, 50, some people mm-hmm. saying like, oh, it hints at future things. And it kind of makes sense within the gist of Star Trek and what they're trying to do at this point that the Romulans are behind this. And then the others saying like, this feels like a hat on a hat. Like, what is the point of having this element introduced at this, at this moment? Let me take it two ways. Let me ask you small picture, the scene in and of itself and big picture, what mm-hmm. it means for the series. How do you feel mm-hmm. about those two things? I'll just say I didn't like it either way. It's like I did not like it didn't need to be tied into reunification. It didn't have to be tied into laying out, oh, the Romulans are out there doing shenanigans, trying to create war and discord so that they can, you know, take over. They don't want all these people getting unified because it'll be a, a bigger threat to them. I didn't want them laying all the groundwork for that stuff. It was unnecessary, mm-hmm. uh, in my opinion for this. It was also like such a, like the mustache twirling emotional Voss, it was like a, it felt like a punchline to me of like, that's why he's been twirling that mustache because he's working with yeah. the Romulans. It's like the emotional Romulans. So it's like, it was so over the top. It's like, that was, it felt like a cheat. It's just like, there was a, all about it. Just, it, it, no. Yeah. <laughs> just no, I don't, yeah. I don't care how you want to split the ending. I just didn't like it. I, th- I thought it was t- too on the nose. It was too unnecessary. It just, it, it was just like a sad trombone playing like at the very end for me. I agree with you. I hit the point at the end of the episode when we see the Romulan's back is turned to us and he has the telltale grid pattern yeah. in his, in his clothing, which is the, uh, very easily identifiable as a Romulan. And you hear the conversation between him and Bloss and immediately I was like, Oh God, small picture, not necessary for this episode, big picture. It contradicts to a certain amount to a certain degree, a lot of what's to come in the original series and in next generation where the Romulan threat is very thoroughly developed along the lines of Vulcans have more or less forgotten the relationship during the era of the original series. So for this to be here in this moment really feels like an alien race, the Romulans is talking about reunifi- reunifying with Vulcan. And the only people to know are a tiny little fraction of a handful of loss and whoever co-conspirators he has. Like it just doesn't jive that when later on in the original series, when we first see Romulans, it is a big reveal that Romulans and Vulcans yep. look alike. It is the thrust of a, of a well-known episode in the original series. So doing this right now felt like, okay, you had me with this, like we need to build a bridge and then they kind of blow up their own bridge right there at the end. They kind of fell flat for me. The better way to do it would be there's an invisible guiding hand that they still don't know who it is kind of a thing. Like somebody was behind this, but we're not sure who kind of a thing, but you couldn't do that because it'd be like not as obvious enough as they needed to be. They needed to let everybody know it's Romulan's wink. So it's like, it just is completely unnecessary. They should have yeah. just cut it completely. Yeah. And it continues to be part of what I think is the conflict within season four, which is it is now a Friday night show. So you can see the arguments that we've been making about like making it more kid friendly, more action focused. But then this Mm -hmm. at the end is only going to be picked up by adult audiences who know those connective threads. So for a younger viewer where this is supposed to be an action-y sci-fi show, they're going to be like, why the menace? Like, what does this mean? This doesn't have any bearing on anything. So it's going to be, it's almost like by trying to stick themselves in the middle path, they're lost. So it's a continuing Mm -hmm. struggle for the show at this point. And it keeps going back to me for the entirety of this series, the exhaustion on the part of the people who are making it, they didn't quite know how to plant fresh seeds for themselves where a certain audience was happy to consume whatever they made. And I count myself among them, but Mm -hmm. the difficulty of, of the creators feeling like they were making something worthwhile sometimes that exhaustion kind of is on display. So next time we're going to be talking about the episode Daedalus. Matt, any predictions about what we'll be talking about when we talk about Daedalus? A Daedalus? 
Yes, exactly. That is the best mm -hmm. plot summary I've ever heard. I'm going to go to Wikipedia and I'm going to change the summary on Wikipedia to that. So <laughs> next week you will be saying Daedalus. <laughs> Before we sign off, Matt, is there anything you want to share about what's coming up on your main channel? By the time this episode is out, I should have a new one about my super energy efficient net zero energy home that I'm building and update about how that's going and had some nail biting anxiety ridden moments during, during the build, mm. which are explored in the video. I look forward to checking that out. As for me, if you want to visit my website, seanfarrell.com, you can find out more information about my books. You can also go to your local bookseller or stores like Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Anywhere you buy your books, you should be able to find mine. And that includes now available for pre-order my next book, which is a middle grade novel. It's the beginning of a series. It's called The Sinister Secrets of Singe. And it is about a young boy who builds robots and goes on adventures with a bunch of pirates. So I hope you'll want to check that out and share that with kids in your life. If you'd like to support the show, please consider reviewing us on Apple, Google, Spotify, wherever it was you found this. Go back there, leave a review, subscribe and share us with your friends. And if you'd like to directly support us, you can go to trekintime.show, click the become a supporter button there. It allows you to throw coins at our heads. We appreciate the bruises. And when you do so, it will make you an ensign. And being an ensign means you will start getting our spinoff show, which is out of time, in which we talk about anything not related to this series, which is maybe we talk about other Star Trek shows, or we talk about Star Wars, or Lord of the Rings, or like in today's case, I think we're going to be talking a little bit about some anime. We're going to also be talking about some mystery series. So we hope not you'll just, subscribe not just any to anime. that. Not just any anime. It's My Hero Academia, which was recommended to us by some of our viewers. So some of our yes. viewers shared that with, with Matt. So uh, yeah. we hope you'll be interested in checking that out. And once again, you get that by supporting us directly through trekintime.show. All of that really does help support the show. Thank, thank you so much, everybody, for listening or watching. And we'll talk to you next time. Thank you.